All right. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. My name is Nolan Irk, and I'm going to give a talk today called CFML Design Patterns and Uses. We're going to look at some different design patterns and how to use them in your Cold Fusion applications. Uh, a little bit about me. I run South of Shasta. This is a developer consultancy. We're based in Sacramento, California. Uh, I do a variety of Cold Fusion projects, as well as different types of software development, training for other teams, and a little bit of web design along the way. Uh, we teach a variety of classes for developers as well. Uh, I manage the SAC Interactive User Group. That was sort of the new version of what used to be our Cold Fusion User Group. So it starts it started as a CFUG and has morphed into a little bit more of an all-encompassing web and mobile group. Uh, before that, I used to program video games for quite a while. And I'm willing to bet I spend more money on concert tickets and music than anyone else at the conference. Uh, the room I'm sitting in right now actually looks like this. There are records and CDs all over the walls. Um, I am quite proud of my music collection. Um, if you don't want to take a lot of notes today, you can just jot down this GitHub address. That is where all of the slides and all of the code demos I'm showing today are stored. You can just grab that stuff later rather than frantically typing throughout this hour. Uh, just make it easy for everyone. Just go there. There are a couple of tiny little tweaks I've made to the slides that are not quite live yet. So if you want to get the absolute 100% exact what I'm showing right now, give me about an hour or two and I'll update the code uh, co repo later today with everything and you'll be all set. Um, some prerequisites for today. Uh, hopefully you have some experience using CF components. You do not need to be an expert with them. Uh, you should know something about what inheritance means and hopefully composition. Uh, hopefully you've done some work with interfaces. I don't mean UI interfaces like buttons and checkboxes. I mean the interface OO keyword. Uh, if you have not used that before too much, don't worry a lot about that. We're going to do a demo today that will help sort of bridge the gap on interfaces for you as well. Uh, you do not need to have used an MVC framework. If Coldbox still seems scary to you, if Framework 1 still seems weird to you, Model Glue Mach 2, any of them, don't worry about it. Everything we're doing today will work in any Cold Fusion application you have, whether you're using a framework or not. All you have to do is be running some sort of a relatively current version of Cold Fusion. If you're on CF4 or 7 still, I'm sorry, you're kind of out of luck, but if you're on, you know, 11 or above, you're probably just fine. And one other thing you need to know about the talk today is object-oriented programming is hard. And some of the stuff that we do is confusing at first. Some of these concepts like inheritance and composition, certain design patterns, certain other concepts that have nothing to do with OO programming, just something else in programming in general, often confuses developers along the way. Um, and that is totally normal. If we go over a demo today and part of the syntax or one of the concepts seems strange to you, seems like this is just not what I wanted to, um, this is not what I was expecting, this is you know confusing, there's a problem with it, you're just not getting it for whatever reason. I promise you are not alone. Everybody who has done object-oriented programming in Cold Fusion, in C++, in whatever language, they have all stumbled when reaching some particular topic along the way. Any developer who tells you every bit of OO programming made perfect sense to them is lying to you. So don't feel bad if something seems confusing. Uh, here's what we're gonna go over today. I'm gonna show you what we're gonna talk about, what are design patterns and why would we want to use them in our applications. I'm gonna give you some common design patterns we're gonna give sort of basic examples of how they work. And then we'll talk about some examples of when you might wanna use them in a little bit more of a real world situation. I'll also give you some useful tips on other things to keep in mind when using design patterns in your apps and just general OO principles in general. And I'll point you towards some other resources that you can use to learn more about object-oriented programming and design patterns. So what is a design pattern? Uh, that's a fancy word for saying this is a way to organize the components so that they work together in a flexible way. So what does that mean? Well, just like in any programming, procedural, object-oriented programming, whatever, you've got things like a for loop and an if statement and an array, right? You don't always use a for loop or an array in your programming. You use it when that is the right tool to solve a particular problem in your application. That's a reusable technique based around common problems that pop up in any type of code you're building, whether it's a video game, a message board forum, a student portal, whatever, they all might need an array at some point. You might need a for loop at some point. That's just a reusable construct you have in your code. And design patterns are that exact same idea, except instead of typing the syntax for like CF loop or an array, you're taking CF components 
putting certain chunks of code in them and then connecting those components together in a common way that has been seen to solve a particular problem that pops up in a variety of software applications out there. There are lots of different design patterns that exist, singleton, factory, MVC, finite state machines, bunches of others, some that you might never actually use in your software career, and some that you might end up using all the time, depending on what kind of stuff you're building. These are just tools to have in your toolbox like anything else. Design patterns are not platform specific. Everything we're gonna talk about today conceptually will work in Cold Fusion. It'll work in Java, C++, .NET, with some uh, oh, extra noodling. You can get it to work in JavaScript as well, depending on how you're doing your JavaScript applications. Most any OO language can do some variation of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today. And the naming conventions and the overall concepts we're talking about, how they're designed and built, are pretty similar across the board too. So you can take the knowledge you're getting today on let's say a singleton or a factory pattern, which are two things we're gonna go over. And you can talk intelligently to a .NET developer, a C++ developer, any other OO developer out there and say, I'm building a factory that creates these kind of things. And they will know what you're talking about. They will be able to build the exact same kind of thing in their code base and vice versa with just you know the little bits of syntax that are different from CFML to something like .NET or C++. Uh, using design patterns does not require an MVC framework. I think I mentioned this earlier. If you're not on Coalbox or Framework 1 or any MVC framework of any sort, everything we're doing today, you can absolutely do in your application as it stands right now. Even if you still have just a bunch of spaghetti code that's in .cfm files and you're kind of new to CF components, you don't have any CFCs in your app yet whatsoever, you can actually use these techniques as the first few CFCs you build in your app. Although... I would suspect if your app is all still procedural .cfm files and no components, the learning curve might be a little bit high in that regard. So maybe you would take some baby steps before going from that code base into the design pattern stuff. But you don't have to rewrite your whole app in cold box or anything like that to take advantage of these topics today. You can use one design pattern in your app. You can use all of them. You can use two or three. You can combine them together. There's no rule that says if you use design pattern A, you have to use patterns B, C, and D as well. Again, it's like a for loop or an array. Pick the right tool for the job, drop it into your application to solve a problem, and move on. I promise they are not scary. All right, so I've been talking a lot. Let's look at some patterns. First pattern we're going to talk about is the singleton pattern. Singleton ensures that you have a CFC, and one and only one copy of that CFC gets created and used by your entire application. So if you have some component that gets accessed in 10 different CFM files, Rather than creating 10 copies of that component, you would create one copy of that component and share it somewhere or in a certain way so that all 10 of those .cfm pages, when they're running across all of the different users in your app, they all use that one CFC rather than their own 10 specific copies of that component. That's called a singleton. You make one single component. And we're gonna take a look at how that works right now. It works with your application scope. You probably have already used application scopes in your application CFCs, hopefully. When I stuff something into my application scope, here I'm stuffing this music utilities CFC in there, I have one application scope for my entire app. If I have one user or a thousand users, they all share this one application scope. I have one single copy of this music utility component in my entire application that is a singleton. That's it. I didn't have to do anything. All I have to do is take the component I built and stick it in my application scope. And as long as I'm not doing anything completely outlandish with like locking the scope and then making a stupid copy of it into another application or try, trying to break the system. As long as I'm not trying to break the system and I'm just using a standard application CFC, sticking things like this in there, that's my singleton. And you can see I'm not doing anything crazy here. Here's my music utility component. It's just got a constructor and it's got a couple of methods that return some different types of data for us. And I will go ahead and run that so you can make sure that I'm not giving you any Smoke and mirrors, this is all working code. Spin up my singleton demo. And while that's firing up, we'll take a look at what we have in our code here. So my, I have a metal page. It just calls that component, calls the get middle bands method. It returns an array and it's gonna loop over and draw those items out on the screen. I've got a punk page that calls the punk band method and does the exact same thing. And I've got a synthpop.cfm file that calls the get simp pop bands method and outputs those results on the screen. The CFC in question looks like this. 
There's no magic syntax in here. I don't have the word singleton written anywhere in the component. I don't have the word singleton in my application CFC. There's no keyword you have to use. There's no tag you have to install. Just hopefully you already know how to do this one. You just put it in here and you can see all of the pages in my app are using that one copy of that music utility component. So nothing crazy there. Pretty straightforward, easy way to start our talk on design patterns. Turn that off. But now let's talk about the strategy pattern. Strategy is for when you have classes that are kind of the same, but not exactly the same enough to where you wanted to use inheritance to have one base component and have all the functionality copied exactly down into the different child CFCs. When you have the exact business logic that is exactly the same across all of them, sure, use inheritance. For other stuff though, you wanna do something else. Strategy pattern and uses of interfaces is a good example of when you can do that. And ducks are a really good way to describe when you might wanna use an interface. Let's talk about what I mean by ducks. I mean the actual animal that you would find out in you know, water across the planet. Ducks can do four things, right? They can fly, swim, quack, and eat. So if I had a duck.cfc file, I might have four methods in it. Fly, swim, quack, and eat from a sea of functions. Well, can all ducks do those things? Sure, probably. Well, what about rubber duck toys like you would have in the bathtub for your kid? They can't fly. I could pick the rubber duck up and throw it at you, but that's not really flying. They don't really swim, but they do float in the water. And that's similar to swimming, but not really the same thing. They don't quack, but they do squeak, which you could argue is a variation of quacking and they don't really eat. So we have, let's say a, a live duck, like a mallard that can fly, swim, quack and eat, but a rubber duck can do two of those things kind of, and two of those things, not at all. So I wouldn't really want to use inheritance there to describe a rubber duck and a duck because they're not exactly the same. The functionality is different enough between the two. Well, what about wooden decoy ducks? Wooden decoy ducks cannot fly. Again, I could throw it at you, but that's not really the same thing. They don't swim, but they do float similar to how a rubber duck in the bathtub might float. You just put it out in the water in the lake or whatever. They don't quack and they don't eat. So I've got three different types of ducks. Let's say a mallard, a rubber duck toy, and a wooden decoy. They're all ducks, but the functionality is different enough between the three of them that it's not exactly the same. I can't have one copy of a swim method and all three of these child classes use that method. I have to do some other work to get that to behave properly. That's where we're gonna use the strategy demo to uh, solve that problem. Come over here. Strategy looks like this. Let's go into our code. Here I have a wooden decoy and I'm just gonna give it a color brown. Let's take a look at that component. There's not a whole lot in here. I have a constructor, I set the color, and it's got a swim method because that's all that wooden decoys can do. They can swim, they can't fly, quack or eat. I need to just move these zoom tools out of the way. If you'll pardon me for one moment, there we go. And let's go ahead and run that code so you can see what happens. Just so you know that I'm not feeding you any Smoke and mirrors here. We're going to run that code. Fires up. Do, 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 do. And there's my code running right here. Wooden decoy swims. Now let's nick a rubber duck. Rubber duck can swim and it can quack, but it doesn't really swim. It sort of floats and it doesn't really quack. It sort of squeaks, right? So it has its own variation of those things. And I can do both of those here. And I have a mallard that can do all four of those things, fly, swim, quack, and eat. Spin that on, you can see all of these run here too. Let's take a look at the code. So wooden decoy was pretty simple. It has a swim method, it extends duck, and it implements this I swimmable interface. Let's take a look at that duck base class, see what's in there. It's got a color and a constructor. So there's nothing really happening in our duck base class. It's just the way to say mallard, wooden decoy, and rubber duck are all types of it is a duck. We're using inheritance here just for some basic code reuse with our constructor. Now let's take a look at our 
yellow duck, which is the rubber, rubber duck for the bathtub. It also extends duck, and this one implements the eye swimmable interface and the eye quackable interface. Rubber ducks can swim. Really, it's the variation of swimming we're using called floating, and it can quack, but it doesn't really quack. It squeaks, which is its own variation of quacking. It doesn't float. You could have other functionality in here specific to a rubber duck, like maybe it gets a suntan or does something crazy like that that is specific to this one as opposed to a wooden decoy or a mallard. But the main takeaway here is notice how we're extending the same base class that we have here. So a wooden decoy is a type of duck. Rubber duck is a type of duck. Wooden decoy implements the I swimmable interface, which just says you have to make a method called swim. And rubber duck says you have to make a method called swim and whatever this I quackable interface does. That just says you have to make a method called quack. Notice how in these interfaces, these ones that begin with an I and they have the word interface instead of component. Notice how these are just method signatures, just the method name. There's no curly brackets with actual code in here. When you use an interface, you actually put the details of what that method does in the CFC itself. You just put this implements bit at the top here so that the cold fusion engine knows to enforce the rule of these interfaces when it compiles this component. So when I compile wooden decoy, it's going to say, okay, when I make a wooden decoy, it implements I swimmable. Go look inside that CF interface. It says, ah, there's a method called public any function swim. So any component that implements swimmable must have a method with that signature in it somewhere in the CFC. Rubber duck has two of those, swimmable and quackable. So we have to have that swim method and we have to have that quack method, which is defined here in the I quackable interface. And our mallard also extends duck and it implements four interfaces, fly, swim, quack, and eat. And they all work the exact same way that you expect them to. There's the eat one, it's an interface with that method, and there's the fly one. There's no limit to how many interfaces you can have a CFC implement in your component. This is Cold Fusion and Java's way of getting around the fact that uh, we cannot do multiple inheritance. You can only extend from one thing but you can implement a bunch of different interfaces to sort of give you similar functionality to multiple inheritance. And now I have wooden decoys that do their version of swimming, which is floating in the water, rubber ducks that do their version of swimming, floating in the bathtub. They do their version of quacking, which is squeaking when you, you know, squeeze the toy. And then mallards do their version of those two things plus the two things that only mallards can do because they're using the other two interfaces. turn this one off. Whoops. Typo. Yep. All right. So when would you want to use something like those interfaces? Well, when you're building like a real world payroll system, for instance, you might have full-time employees, contractors, and interns. They all get paid. So they would have some sort of I payable interface with a method in it called pay this person or whatever you want to call it. But you're, the way you're going to pay full-time employees is going to be different than how you pay your contractors and your interns, right? Employees are probably going to have a retirement plan of some sort, maybe a health insurance package. Your contractors probably get an hourly wage, and that's about it. Your interns probably get something else entirely. So you can have three different CFCs, a full-time employee CFC, a contractor one, and an intern one. They can all implement the same I payable interface with their own version of pay this person, pay this person methods in it. And then the rest of your code doesn't care what type of CFC it's dealing with, they all know that they will have a pay this person method inside them. And if they're all following the same interface, they will all work the exact same way. So whoever the lead developer is that's building the engine for this application doesn't have to worry about who wrote the full-time employee component or how the contractor employee, um, how the contractor CFC was implemented. They'll all work the exact same way because they follow the same interfaces. Uh, you can build things like video games that do this exact same type of work. You might have things that fly in your application. Birds, insects, and spaceships are all different, but they're going to have some version of flying functionality in their code. Um, if you're thinking, Nolan, nobody uses CFML to build video games, uh, there was a talk two years ago here at CF Summit, which is a great presentation. I'm blanking on the gentleman's name who gave it, but it was all about building video games using React and CFML. Uh, so there are definitely people doing that sort of thing out there in the real world. You can use Cold Fusion for lots of different functionality. 
Uh, let's look at the factory pattern. Factory patterns are used for creating different variations of the same type of object. Uh, in a typical CFC situation, you would call create object or use the CF object tag, create a CFC and then use it directly. Rather than calling create object directly in your code, with a factory pattern, you have a factory CFC and you tell that thing, please go make the CFC for me. So you're adding one extra CFC to your code base and that thing is making the components for you. I'm gonna show you a real quick demo of what a factory does. Here I have an actor CFC that's got a little bit of functionality in it, recite from script, paste tag dues, and it extends entertainer. I've got an author CFC. It also extends entertainer and it's got some author specific functionality in there. And I've got a musician CFC that has some musician specific functionality in there and it also extends entertainer. Let's take a look at that class. Here's my entertainer base class. We've got some properties just to have some real world-ish data in here for our app to work with. And you can see that anything that extends my entertainer class can get paid and go on vacation. Pretty standard inheritance stuff in CFC is nothing new there. Here's my entertainer factory. It's one method, one CFC. You construct it and it's got a method in it called create entertainer. You pass it a type and it will tell you, it will create one of these types of components for you based on whatever you pass in there. I'm gonna go ahead and run this so you can see that it is in fact working code. And we'll go ahead and spin that one up. And back over here in my browser, we'll load it up and we're gonna take a look at the index page. You can see I've making a new entertainer factory, create an entertainer, I'm passing an author. So when it returns back this variable right here, when I dump it out on the screen, I should have an author and I do, I'll try to make that bigger so you can see it. It is in fact an author that extends entertainer and there's all of my stuff from that component. If I go in here and change author to musician and refresh it, you can see now I get a musician. And if I give it some garbage value that is not one of those types of entertainers, it throws an error that says, I don't know what you tried to do there, which is what we expect it to do. So this is all working code. Now, why would I go about doing something like that in my app? Well, let's turn off this demo. Now that you know what the basic syntax does for a factory pattern, if I can get my hand to work properly, I'll type that second dot and there we go. Now let's look at another demo of factories. Here's factory two. So in this factory pattern, I've got a file called SQL factory CFC. It's gonna be a constructor. I'm passing in a database type. And in this one, I've got a method called create model. This is my factory, just like the create entertainer from the last CFC. I'm gonna pass in a table name in this one instead. And I wanna just look in this models folder for one of these three different database types. And you can see in each of those three database types, I've got a customer's CSC. Let's look at the MySQL one. And you can see it's a pretty standard business object with some basic SQL functionality in it. It's talking to these MySQL specific tables. Um, full disclosure, I'm not actually running three databases on my laptop right now. Uh, the idea of running three database apps and a cold fusion server and Zoom at the same time while trying to give a live demo seemed dangerous at best. So you're going to have to just take my word for, me, for it that uh, this code will actually work with real databases when it's wired up to those different engines. But we can see the code running and take a look at how that stuff uh, behaves. Let's go back here. Did I run that one? Or do I have that? Let's go open at home. All right, so you can see now, let's take a look at the index page for this demo. And I made a SQL factory component passed in the MySQL saying, please make me, a, we're gonna make MySQL stuff with this factory today. Here's my factory. Create me model for the customers table, please. That's gonna dip into the MySQL folder, look for the customer CFC and return that item back for me, which you can see right there on the screen. It is in fact going into the MySQL folder in my app and creating that version of the component for me. If I go back here and change MySQL to Oracle, and load it up. You can see now it's looking in the Oracle's folder and creating that version of the component for me. 
And again, if I change it to Microsoft SQL Server, it'll work the exact same way like you expect it to. There's the Microsoft version of that code. So it is in fact running and creating our versions of these components. There's nothing useful in these model folders here. There's nothing different about any of these CFCs. I take it back. I'm implementing an iCustomer interface. I lied, sorry. Um, iCustomer interface just has these method names in it. That's just to make sure that all three of my database vendor types all have methods that are named the exact same way. That way they're all interchangeable in the rest of my code base. Similar to the flyable, quackable thing we saw in the earlier presentation. The main uh, chunk of design pattern code here is a little bit that methods in it, that uh, interface. Most of it is the SQL factory here. We have this factory that goes into the models folder, figures out what database type we're on, and returns one of those back for me to the rest of my application. So in my code, rather than doing create object models.mysql.customer or models.oracle.products or whatever the database table is that I want code for, I would just tell this factory, please go make me a product table or product component or a customer component, whatever CFCs I have in these folders. It will look at the type that I gave it when the app started up and it will always make Microsoft components or Oracle components or whatever the database type is you want to deal with there. So why would I wanna do that kind of thing? Well, you can support multiple database engines like we just saw. So if I have a CMS platform that I want to uh, create a CMS engine, make it an open source app that anyone can download and hook up to whatever their database of choice is, this is a really easy way for me to support Oracle, MySQL, and Microsoft SQL, and whatever other databases I want to, without having to have a bunch of spaghetti code in my components that talk to SQL. I don't have anything like, if database engine equals Oracle, do your joins this way. Else if you're on MySQL, do your group buys or your temp tables or whatever this way. Anything that is vendor specific, I can just make those vendor specific folders, put all the code in there, ship one app, with everything compartmentalized. And all my Oracle specific stuff is in one folder, all my MySQL stuff is in one folder and so on. Makes it really easy for you to add new types of database support, keeps everything nice and easy to work and it um, changes at runtime. So if you have a customer or whatever that wants to switch between MySQL and uh, what is that other one, Mariah database, the variation of MySQL that's out there, you can make a um, Mariah database folder and do the exact same thing that way. <clears throat> It's a really easy way to make shrink drag software, whether it's a CMS engine or not, um, make that available to your customers. And localization support is really easy with this too. You wanna to support multiple languages rather than hard coding your strings of text and your other resources in the app that might be, you know, you wanna have a French version and a German version and a, you know, whatever, make a folder for each of those languages, put components in there that return those bits of data back to you in the given language or in the given format, whatever it is you're trying to do, and just have a factory go pick whichever of those you want to use at runtime. Uh, now let's take a look at the adapter pattern. So adapter takes two or more CSEs that are different, but they need to run in the same way in your application. You have one that works the quote unquote correct way, and you have another one that is either out of date or came from a different vendor, or for whatever reason, it's just different. And you need to adapt that CFC to work the same way as the other one does in the rest of your application. It's similar to the idea of in a real world, sometimes you have three prong power outlets on your wall in your house. And sometimes there's a two prong outlet. You need to be able to plug any sort of plug for your electrical devices into those outlets, whether it's two or three. The same concept, but with code. We're gonna take a look at that here. And while that's firing up, we'll go back over here and we will take a look at our adapter code. And I'm gonna use animals again. We had the ducks before. I've got my mallard CFC before from before. We can construct a mallard. It can fly and it can quack. And I've got a turkey. You can construct that. They gobble, they don't really quack. And they fly, but they can't fly for as long of a distance as ducks can. So the same quote unquote method, but it has its own version of functionality inside it. Here's version one of my app. I'm gonna make three mallards, stuff them into an array, loop over those and call the quack methods and fly methods in my application. It looks like those work just like I expect them to, cool. 
Now let's take those same three mallards from before, add three turkeys, stuff all of them into an array. And now when I loop over them, the turkey CFC doesn't have a quack method, does it? It's got a gobble method. Similar kind of functionality, but it's named differently with a different method signature. Maybe this turkey component was made by a previous developer that didn't communicate well with us. Maybe it came from a third party vendor and we had no control over what the methods were named. Whatever the case is, it's kind of the same functionality. I wanna group it in here with the rest of my animal stuff, but this is probably going to throw an error when I fire it up there. And you can see it does in fact throw an error. Now let's take a look at using mallards and turkeys just like before. But in this one, we have a new component called a turkey adapter. And we're gonna take the turkeys we made here, stick them into the adapters and get adapted turkeys out the other side. And instead of putting ducks and turkeys directly into my array, I'm gonna put ducks and adapted turkeys into my array. And let's take a look at what that turkey adapter does. It's got a turkey property in it just to have a spot to save the turkey that we pass in through the constructor. And just like the duck, our turkey adapter has a quack method that's gonna call that turkey's gobble method. So when I do this quack, it's going to dip into here and run that quack method, which calls the gobble method. I've also got this fly method down here. And since turkeys cannot fly for the same distance that ducks can, anytime I call the fly on my adapted turkey, it's gonna actually call that fly method in the actual turkey component three times to make up for the difference in how long a duck can fly versus how long a turkey can fly. And that's gonna go ahead and run here. And you can see there's my ducks and here's my turkeys. And it all works now with this one array of code. Turn that one off, go back over here, close this. All right, so my, why might I wanna use that? Well. If you have different vendor APIs you're swapping out in your application, maybe you've got like a geolocation library or something to that effect in your app. Vendor one, you've been using them for years and years. Their app works a certain way. You want to switch to vendor number two because the prices are better or they have some functionality that you like instead. If you just directly call all of vendor one's methods straight in your code, when you switch to vendor two, you might have a whole bunch of code that in your application has method names that are specific to vendor one's uh, code base. That's all gonna break when you drop vendor two's code libraries into your application, right? Well, instead of just dropping vendor two's code in and stopping with a broken application, drop vendor two's code in, build an adapter so that your vendor two functionality has the same method names as the vendor one stuff that's been in your app for years and years, and just use that adapter instead. Now, none of the code in your main code base has to actually change. You can get really easy ways to swap new vendors in and out in your application like this. Sometimes people feel scared when they have like vendor lock-in. They feel like, oh, we've been stuck using this library for a long time and they're expensive now, or it's brittle or has security holes or whatever. This is a really easy way to get around that problem. <clears throat> One more pattern we're gonna look at, it's called the decorator pattern. Decorators let you add new behavior to CFCs. Uh, it's kind of a replacement for really large tangled inheritance trees. Uh, decorators also happen at runtime, whereas inheritance happens at compile time. So if you want to switch a component, say it's being decorated by these three components, and you want to switch that and have it decorated by seven different components instead, you don't actually have to change any code and restart your application to do that. You can have these things happen at runtime in your code as opposed to inheritance, which you cannot do that with. So here's an example we're going to talk about for this one. Say I'm building code for an espresso machine. I've got four types of coffee I want to uh, build in my app, house blend, dark roast, espresso, and decaf. I'm gonna probably have a house blend.cfc, a dark roast.cfc, and then two more for espresso and decaf. Sometimes customers wanna have whipped cream on top of those, and sometimes they wanna have hazelnut, drizzle, you know, the drizzle stuff, and sometimes they wanna have both of those on top. Well, I'll have my four components for the four main types of coffee. And then if I wanna have them with and without whipped cream, I'm gonna to have to have eight components for the plain version and then the version with whipped cream. So each one of these would be a CFC. And if I wanna do that with hazelnut, now I've gotta have them plain with whipped cream, with hazelnut, and with both whipped cream and hazelnut. 
that's a whole lot of CFCs to deal with an application. And this is just with a fairly small set of stuff people would have in an application like this. Let's take a look at the decorator pattern and see how we would solve this problem. Close this demo down. All right, well, that's firing up. I'm gonna take a look here at our decorators. So here is my Espresso CFC. And you see there's not a whole lot in it. It's got a constructor. It saves the name of that type of coffee and it's got a method for cost. It extends beverage. Let's take a look at our beverage CFC base class. It's just got a spot where we store the description. My constructor is up there and I have this abstract method, if you will, called cost. Notice there's nothing in it. We're gonna actually set cost in the different types of beverages that we inherit from this class. So when I run this first one, nothing crazy happens there. Espresso.get description outputs, it's an espresso and espresso.cost outputs that it's a buck 99. Now let's output the dark roast. I'll take a look at the dark roast CFC. Same kind of thing in here, nothing different other than, you know, the name of the item is different and the cost is a little bit different. Espresso and dark roast. Now let's get into the fancy stuff. I'm gonna take that dark roast that I made up here on line six. I'm gonna pass it into this Mocha CFC. And let's take a look at that one. Mocha CFC is a condiment decorator. It has a beverage inside it. You pass the beverage into the constructor, it saves it. It's got a method called get the description, which is gonna take the description of whatever the beverage was you gave it. In this case, it's that dark roast thing. And it's gonna tack on Mocha flavoring to it. It's also got a cost method. It's gonna take the cost of whatever beverage you gave it, and it's gonna add 20 cents to it for the mocha flavoring. Now, when I run that, you can see here's my espresso, here's my dark roast, and here's my dark roast with the mocha flavoring. Notice how the description has been updated at runtime, and the price has been updated as well at runtime. I didn't actually go in and change any of my CFCs. I didn't have to build a dark roast mocha.cfc. It just knows take the dark roast and decorate it with the mocha component. The functionality in one will wrap around the other one and decorate that item for me. Now let's get even fancier with this one. Take that same dark roast that I made up here and I'm gonna use the soy decorator, which looks like this. Also a condiment decorator, take a beverage in, save it. I've got a get description method and a cost method, just like I did in the mocha decorator earlier. It's gonna take whatever description I gave it and just use soy in addition to whatever was there before, not instead of, but in addition to what I got passed in. And the same thing with cost, take whatever the cost was that I gave it and in addition to that cost, add a buck on here for soy milk. Same thing for whipped cream. Beverage in, it's a condiment decorator. You get the idea. And when I run this one, you can see that here is my fancy version of the drink. Dark roast, mocha, soy, and whip, $2.80. It added up all of the different costs in those different items. They were all decorated together as the application ran. And here's the CF dump of what that actually looks like in your application. I've got a beverage that is a type of dark roast. I'm sorry, it's a dark roast. It is a type of beverage. And that is being decorated with this mocha item. You see that's a condiment decorator. And that is being decorated with this soy CFC. And that is being decorated with this whipped cream uh, decorator component on top of that. And all of this is happening at runtime while these CFM files, uh, sorry, while these CFM lines of code are being executed in my application. All right, so real world spots where you might wanna use that. Well, anywhere that you have a bunch of options or optional type of code that you wanna turn on and off as things are happening in your application. Anytime you have dynamic or flexible business logic. You want to, like sometimes you want to have this business logic applied, sometimes you don't. Uh, you can add logging to certain types of things in your application. Maybe certain users need to have extra logging and polling around what they're doing in your application, or maybe when certain tasks run, like not the cron jobs and things like that, you want to have something happen. Uh, if you have certain users that you know are traveling a lot, you're building a login system and you want to validate who's logging in. Maybe you want to dynamically add two-factor authentication to certain types of users as they run in your system. You can you have a a two-factor authentication decorator that gets added. Uh, later on in your application, you could have 
a feature flag decorator that gets dynamically added when maybe certain users add new beta tested, you know, or features that are still in beta to your code or whatever. Uh, you can just add CSCs that do different types of decorating into your app and apply that decorator to whatever other functionality there is in your application. You don't actually have to build, you know, such and such decorator.csc and then some other thing decorator.csc. You just pull the decorators and apply them everywhere. Uh, some other useful tips for learning design patterns. Don't feel like you have to jump in head first. We went over several of them today. Some of them for me were easier to understand at first than others. Uh, I suspect most developers are about the same. Treat it like a tool in your toolbox. Again, use an array or a for loop when you need to use an array or a for loop. If there's no point in putting them in your code, skip them. Same thing with design patterns. Uh, try to use obvious naming conventions when you build these components. Like mine was actually called sqlfactory.csc. I would probably call it sqlfactory.csc or something close to that in a real application as well. So it's easy to tell, oh, this is the factory that I use to make the different database stuff in my app. Uh, this is the adapter I'm supposed to use to convert vendor one's code into vendor two's code or vice versa. I would call it something adapter.csc. I would actually use those words. Um, another item we did not talk about, but is also very useful in this sort of scheme of things is a topic called dependency injection. Uh, that topic, often confuses a lot of developers. It confused the bejesus out of me quite a bit when I first started getting into OO programming. Um, we didn't talk about it today, but it's well worth your time kind of trying to understand that stuff a little bit better. Shameless plug, I've given a talk called Dependency Injection, Why Is It Awesome? Uh, there are slides for that on southofshasta.com. If you just go to the presentations tab, you can download that slide deck and some code demos and check that out. And if you want me to give a talk at your user group or for your company, just hit me up and I can help you out with that too. <clears throat> so to sum up, design patterns are good. These are a good thing to add to your repertoire. You only need one or two CFCs to build a lot of them. You don't have to have 30 different new components in your app cluttering up everything. The factory was one. The singleton was just stuffing things in our application. Some of them are really easy. Uh, and you are able to combine different patterns together for even more code reuse. I could have an app with singletons and factories and maybe an adapter doing something else. Uh, none of what we did required third-party libraries. There were no zip files installed behind the scenes. I didn't do box install from anywhere to get this running. I didn't grab something off of a GitHub repo anywhere at all. This is all stock things you can do, but with your favorite ColdFusion server version that you're running right now in your, in your, uh, your office, it'll all work just, just as it is, I promise. Um, it does take a little bit of discipline and getting used to using you know, the methods in these components instead of maybe the baked in things like create object. But once you get over that hurdle, it'll become kind of second nature and it'll just be like a habit. Um, other stuff to look at that is really good in this vein. There's a great book called Object Oriented Programming in Cold Fusion made by my dear friend, Matt Gifford. It does not get super far into the design pattern world, but if you still need a little bit of a refresher on what components do and if parts of them are still kind of fuzzy to you, like things like inheritance and composition, uh, check out Matt's book, it's really good. Head First Design Patterns is my favorite book about design patterns by far. All of the code demos in it are written in Java, not CFML, but the explanations in this book of why you do different patterns and what they're useful for and all that is so amazing. It's worth it. And the code demos, even though they're in Java, they're really, really easy to follow and understand. Uh, full disclosure, I ripped off all of the duck mallard stuff, the tricky adapter stuff, anything involving animals today, I stole straight out of that book. I just converted the examples to CFML. It's that good. Um, and if you're looking for another book to talk about super nerdy levels of design pattern stuff, there's a book that is nicknamed The Gang of Four Book. It's got that long title right there in the middle of the slide. Uh, the code demos in that are very much not CFML. It's like C++ and small talk and some other things. And it's got really um, granular details of like when these patterns are useful and why and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a great book for both going really far down this rabbit hole and also putting yourself to sleep if you're having trouble sleeping at night, depending on what kind of mood you're in. Uh, other stuff, uh, again, I teach classes on this sort of thing. You wanna hit me up, I can book a workshop with your team if you want. Uh, there's also a new series of videos called on, on cfcasts.com that I put together with the fine folks at Order Solutions. It talks all about object-oriented programming, several of which touch on design patterns. Um, some of the content overlaps with what we saw today. And then there's other content that we did not get into in those videos. So that's, I forget how many hours of content, uh, over a dozen, I think, um, of info just on OO programming in CFML. Uh, and then again, if you want to go to southofshasta.com slash presentations, I've got 
uh, the slide decks for all of my talks that I give up there. You can just grab whatever one you want. The code demos are up there too. There's a few things about design patterns. There's a few things about other OO stuff in CFML. Go nuts. <clears throat> Real quick, uh, if this seemed overwhelming, you're like, that was a lot of info in 45 minutes, Nolan. I get it. I do. Um, what I recommend is pick a topic, maybe just pick a pattern and try to break it down into 30 minute chunks every day. Um, come up with a goal of like, I will learn how to use the template method pattern or the adapter pattern and just spend 30 minutes a day trying to learn how to do that. Come up with a demo app where you're going to put an, an adapter into something. The trick though is do it every single day. Don't start doing that today, feel overwhelmed and then stop. Like block off a half an hour a day to learn whatever that new topic is. This is one of my favorite methods for learning new stuff, not just learning new technology, but learning other things and being productive, making stuff, shipping product. Do it in half hour chunks every day. I promise everyone has a half an hour free. You can turn off the news. You can turn off the Seinfeld rerun. You can mute the football game, whatever it is, and just block off a half an hour to learn that thing. And if you do it consecutively for a few days in a row, you will learn whatever that topic is. You will finish building that demo app, whatever the thing is you're trying to do. Um, it works, I promise. It works even with this design pattern stuff. And if you're still stuck or just want to chat more about these kind of things, that's how you can find me. Uh, I'm at southeastshafta.com. There's my email and a couple of Twitter links. And again, there's my GitHub link down at the bottom there. The most recent repo at the top of my GitHub profile is the slide deck and code demos for today. And with that, I think I'm done. We've got about four minutes left for questions if there are any questions in the chat uh, for us to take care of. And I'm seeing different things here. Let me turn the, I'm going to stop sharing my slide. Um, actually, I'll just read these here real quick. Let's see here. Uh, for singletons under heavy load, such as threading, even CF lock, it can still throw concurrency errors. It's because CC variable property stored in Java hash map. We need ability flag to see the hash map on the hood. Okay. Um, we need ability flag to say use a concurrent hash map under the hood. I, I believe you. I don't know what you want me to do with that one. Um, is there a GitHub source URL for this demo? Yes, uh, no, github.com slash my name, Nolan Irk, and then just go to the top most repo. Um, it's all in there. Uh, yes, I don't know what demo you're talking about, Misha, but yes, some of the demos in CFML will work without interfaces. That's because CFML is a loosely typed language. Uh, I generally like building the interfaces because it just, although it's not gonna throw a compile error without them, it gives my app consistency and it makes it easier for the code to be more self-documented. And that way, when I have a new developer coming on board, they can just read the interfaces and they know how to build the new, whatever the thing is that they're working on and uh, go from there. What happens if you call rubberduck.fly? Does the calling code have to check for the existence of methods prior to calling? Uh, the rubberduck method, the rubberduck component doesn't have a fly in it, so it would throw an error. Uh, Scott, there's a great library called QB by Eric Peterson that does this exact same thing. I don't know what the exact same thing is you're referring to. Sorry, Scott, I couldn't see the chat um, while this while I was giving the talk. Uh, Mike here, for the adapter pattern, do you ever anticipate needing to have this functionality and add the adapter in advance, even if you're only consuming a single library API? That's a good question. No, I don't usually add the adapter in advance. I would probably add the adapter I would go with vendor one stuff now. And then if, if I just leave vendor one stuff in the app forever, then I'm done. Uh, I would add the adapter when I'm looking at a second vendor that I want to swap in instead of vendor one. And then I would look at, okay, I need to build an adapter to convert vendor two stuff so that it works the same way vendor one stuff does in my code base. I've got one minute left if there's any other questions anyone has. Wrap it up. I think we're done. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll see you in the other sessions.